This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam, in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sirah Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, inshallah, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register or for more info. Okay. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a siratun nabawiyya, the prophetic biography. We have been talking about over the last few sessions uh, one of the major events from the life of the Prophet ﷺ known as Ghazwa to Tabuk, the expedition of Tabuk. We talked about a, a few different stages of this particular event from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the prepara- why it happened, the preparation for it, the journey on the way there, what transpired once they arrived there. And what we're going to be talking about today is the Prophet wasallam and the believers, the 30,000 Muslims that were there with him, their departure from Tabuk. Because if you recall, in the previous session we talked about how um, the emissary from the Roman Emperor had come, had this conversation with the Prophet wasallam, and one of the big takeaways from that particular conversation was the fact that there is not going to be any army coming from the Roman Empire, and there's not going to be any type of fighting that's going to happen at this particular juncture here at this place. <clears throat> so as Ibn Ishaq uh, ta'ala and many of the other scholars of tafsir, they mention that after about 20 days of being there at Tabuk, the Prophet wasallam told the Muslims to pack up their stuff and they were going to be heading back to the city of Medina. There's a particular story that's told at this particular time, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Kathir, many other scholars, they mention it. I can't really recall if I went over it or not. Um, but very briefly, it talks about how when they were journeying back, uh, towards the city of Medina, they passed by a place. And when they passed by that place, there was, we, yes, now I recall. On the way to Tabuk from Medina, we had talked about how there was some water near the ruins of Thamud. And the Prophet ﷺ told the believers, do not take from this water. When they went further up, there was a small little spring that was just bubbling right at the surface. And how... <clears throat> The Prophet ﷺ went there, and then after saying Bismillah and making dua for barakah and blessing, he washed his hands in that water, how it started gushing forth. The same exact thing transpired on the way back to the city of Medina as well, where they started going and they were looking for some water so they could stop, they could make wudu, they could pray, they could kind of relieve themselves, you know, get a drink of water, whatever needed to be done. The Prophet ﷺ sent somebody ahead and they went into one of the valleys, Wadi al Mushaqaq, and they found that there was a little bit of a spring there, but it wasn't enough for an army of 30,000 people to use. The Prophet ﷺ told them, he said, okay, everybody start heading that way, but he said, nobody use the water until I get there, until I arrive there. <clears throat> when they ended up getting there, the Prophet ﷺ asked, "Man sabaqana ila had al Who did anybody use the water before I got here? So the Prophet ﷺ was informed that a couple of people did. They were kind of in a hurry and they wanted to get ahead of the rest of the group, and they went ahead and they used the water there. <coughs> The Prophet ﷺ was very upset with them, he was very angry with them, he said, you should listen to me when I give you instructions. But nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ, he went there and the narration mentions, فَجَعَلَ يَصُبُّ فِي يَدِهِ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَصُبَّ ثُمَّ نَضَحَهُ بِهِ وَمَسَحَهُ بِيَدِهِ وَدَعَى بِمَا شَاءَ اللَّهَ أَنْ يَدْعُوَ فَانْخَرَقَ مِنَ الْمَاءِ 
ما ان له حسا كحس الصواعق فشرب الناس واستقوا حاجتهم منه it says that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went there and he scooped up a little of the a little bit of the water in his hands and he took in his hands and then he started spraying the water back onto where the spring was bubbling from and he was making dua he was asking allah for barakah and blessing and no sooner did the Prophet ﷺ do that, but then the Sahaba say, there was like a roaring sound. And water just came gushing out of the ground, out of the earth, and just started shooting forth. And that eventually provided enough water for all the Muslims and all the believers to be able to go there, drink water from there, and then relieve any of the other needs that they had. So, so, <clears throat> The Prophet ﷺ, actually, the reason why I wanted to mention this is very profound. It obviously demonstrates and highlights one of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. But it also, the Prophet ﷺ at that time, he said, لَإِن بَقِيتُمْ أَوْ مَنْ بَقِيَ مِنْكُمْ لَيَسْمَعَنَّ بِهَذَا الْوَادِي وَهُوَ أَخْصَبُ مَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَمَا خَلْفَهُ He said that whoever lives long enough, will eventually one day hear about the fact that this will be the most fertile valley in this region. And the narrator mentions the fact that no doubt about that fact, after the Prophet ﷺ had passed away, when people would pass through there, that valley had become very famous as being an oasis in that entire region. And that was the effect of the barakah and the blessing of the Prophet ﷺ, and the dua the Prophet ﷺ made at that particular place. <clears throat> There's another very profound lesson that is learned here at this particular instance, and that is the importance of patience. That is the importance of patience. And this was like a physical manifestation of something Allah tells us in the Qur'an. مَن يُطِعِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَعَ اللَّهِ أَطِعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِعُ الرَّسُولِ مَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ God continuously in the Qur'an repeatedly tells us, obey the messenger, listen to the messenger, do what the messenger tells you, do not disobey the messenger. And this is quite literally a physical manifestation of that, that the Prophet ﷺ told them, wait till I arrive. And when a couple of people went in a rush, thinking that they were going to beat the system, they were going to gain the system, and get there before everybody, and be able to take advantage of that, they deprived themselves of that blessing, and the Prophet ﷺ reprimanded them. And that's a stark reminder to us, that a lot of times doing things the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us to do things, might take a little bit longer, it might be a little bit more tedious, it might take a little bit more time, but it's completely worth it every single time. Because of this intangible idea that we believe in, that Allah tells us about in the Qur'an, and that is the idea, the concept of barakah. Blessing, which we normally translate as blessing. Barakah is something that's intangible to us. Barakah is not something that can be measured through a calculator or through a measuring stick. Right? There's no, there's no way to physically measure barakah in something. But it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ And barakah only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a lot of times you see two people who might have the same exact thing or capacity or money or whatever it is, the same amount of time. But it is, there's such a disparity between what both of them are able to achieve through that. And the differentiating factor is barakah. One has barakah on his side and the other does not. And a very fascinating definition of barakah that one of our teachers told us about was that barakah is not having more. Barakah is the ability to do more with less. It is the ability to do more with less. You actually realize through barakah that a lot less suffices. And so this is a very important lesson about the importance and the significance of barakah. And barakah is only found, that blessing is only acquired by obedience to Allah and obedience to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So going forward now, on the way back from Tabuk, there's two more notable stories, and then there's a very profound event that occurs once they arrive back in the city of Medina, that I'd like to try to talk about today, inshallah, and it depends on time. We'll see what we can do. At the very least, talking about the journey home. So while they were heading back home, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu tells a very remarkable story. He says that, قُمْتُ مِن جَوْفِ اللَّيْلِ وَأَنَا مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فِي غَسَوْتِ تَبُوكِ Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu is one of the senior companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Senior meaning that not only just in age, he actually was not that old, because he was a teenager when he accepted Islam. But senior in the sense of, he was very tenured. 
He had been by the side of the Prophet ﷺ since the days of Mecca. And he was very close with the Prophet ﷺ. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu eventually became very distinguished by the fact he was known as Sahibu uh, As-Siwad. Or he was also known as Sahibu Al-Wisada. Sahibu Na'al. Sahibu Siwak. He had all these nicknames. And what these nicknames mean is Wisad, uh, uh, excuse me, Sawad refers to water. That's what they used to call water, especially at nighttime. All right. So he was known as the person who arranges the water for the Prophet ﷺ. He was known as Wisada, the person who arranges a seat for the Prophet ﷺ. In the old age of the Prophet ﷺ, obviously to try to get him, make him a little bit more comfortable. And because what's really remarkable is, the older the Prophet ﷺ got, he did not relent in the least bit in the amount of what he used to do. He, was, he worked just as hard in his 60s as he did in his 40s. Trying to take care of people, serve the people. So he wouldn't slow down even the least bit. But they could notice it took him a little bit longer to get up. And it took him a little bit longer to sit down. And you know, they, they started to notice these things, that he's getting older. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud used to carry a pillow with him all the time, everywhere. And whenever the Prophet ﷺ would sit down, he would always go and he would take the pillow and he would put it behind the Prophet ﷺ so he could be a little bit more comfortable. He was also known as Sahibun Na'al. He used to carry the shoes of the Prophet ﷺ. So when he would enter the masjid or when he would stop to pray, he would grab the shoes of the Prophet ﷺ so just to make sure that he could keep track of them. He was also known as Sahibu Siwak. He would keep track of the miswak, the toothbrush of the Prophet ﷺ. Because the Prophet ﷺ used to clean, clean, clean his mouth so frequently, hygiene was very important to the Prophet ﷺ. So he used to carry around the siwak, the miswak of the Prophet ﷺ. So he was somebody who was always with the Prophet ﷺ. So he tells the story, he says, while we were there at, for the battle, the expedition rather of Tabuk, I was on that journey, and the Prophet ﷺ woke up in the middle of the nights. And when he woke up in the middle of the night to go and pray his tahajjud prayer, his night prayers, I was already awake, I had arranged his water, I had arranged his siwak, I had everything ready to go. But when the Prophet ﷺ woke up, he says that I, we looked off in the distance, and we saw that there was a fire in the, um, you know, on the far end of the encampment. Obviously 30,000 Muslims camped out somewhere. So all the way on the other edge of the camp, there was like a fire that was burning. Not like a fire as in like a fire broke out, but somebody had a fire lit. You know, kind of like at nighttime, if you, you know, um, in your home, if a light is on in one of the rooms at night, you can kind of spot it. I wonder why the light's on. So it's like the light was left on somewhere in the distance. And so he said, we went over there, and what we found was that there was a sahabi who was known by the name of Dhul Bajadain. Dhul Bijadain. Dhul Bijadain. That was what he was known as. That's what we called him. What does that mean? This sahabi, as Ibn Hisham mentions, he had become Muslim not too long ago. When he became Muslim, his tribe kicked him out. He was, he was disowned by his family, he was disowned by his tribe, and they ousted him, they kicked him out. They said, no more room for you here. If you want to be Muslim, get out. And they kicked him out. And he said, okay, let me get my stuff. And they said, no, you can't even get your stuff. Leave now. So you know how a lot of times they say that I left with the shirt on my back? He literally left with the shirt on his back. And what he had on at that time was he had one big uh, piece of cloth. And so eventually what he did was he cut this cloth in half. It was a big shawl, like a huge blanket. He cut it in half and he used to wear half of it around his waist, like an izar. You know when people go for ihram, how they tie the cloth around the bottom. So he used to wear it like that as an izar or a lungi, if somebody knows the word. All right, And he used to use the other half of it around his shoulders as kind of like a shawl. And that's what he wore from that point on forward. He only owned two pieces of cloth. This man gave up everything he had for his Islam. He became Muslim and they disowned him and they kicked him out. And all he left with was two pieces of cloth. One was a lower garment, one was an upper garment. And when he came to the Prophet ﷺ in this particular state, and, the Prophet, and he told the Prophet ﷺ his story, the Prophet ﷺ endearingly and admirably gave him the nickname Dhul Bijadain. You are the man of two cloths. You are the man of two cloths. And it was like an admirable nickname. 
to praise him that look at what this man sacrificed. This man sacrificed everything he owned to be Muslim. So he was very beloved to the Prophet ﷺ because of the sacrifice that he had made. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that when we reached the other side of the army where the light was on, the fire was burning, the campfire, we found that Dhul Bijadain had passed away. He passed away in his sleep. And he says that they, the Prophet ﷺ commanded them to dig a grave for him. And once they dug, they dug the grave for him, the Prophet ﷺ went down into the grave, and Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, they took his body, they had shrouded him, in the same two cloths that he wore, his, that whole time. And they, the Prophet ﷺ, the way that when you bury someone, it takes a couple of people to bring the body to the edge of the grave, and somebody has to get down inside of the grave and receive the body and pull it down. The Prophet ﷺ was so elderly at this time, he's 62 years old. But he said, no, I will get down in the grave. And he got down inside of the grave and he said, hand me the body. And Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma handed the Prophet ﷺ the body and he, he received him in his own arms. And then the Prophet ﷺ laid him down inside of the grave and made dua for him. And the Prophet ﷺ at that time, he said the words, Allahumma inni qad amsaytu radiyan anhu farda anhu. Oh Allah, last night when I went to sleep, I was happy with him, I was pleased with him. So Allah, you be pleased with him as well. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, <clears throat> Ya laytani kuntu sahib al-hafra. That I wish I could have been that man who was buried by the hands of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet made dua for him and asked Allah to be pleased with him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to pass away in a state of pleasure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> you have this example on one side of the simple man who had nothing but the two pieces of cloth that he wore and he left this world and people would have said about him that he was disowned and he didn't have a family, he didn't have a tribe and he didn't have a home and he didn't have anything and anyone. But he left this world successful. But you, on this same journey back, you have the opposite example. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now. Many of the scholars of Sirah have mentioned that Urwat ibn Zubayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates this, that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left the place of Tabuk to go to Medina, when the news reached back in Medina that the Prophet sallallahu has left Tabuk and he's on his way back home, he's on his way back to Medina, a group of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, now, this is something we're going to talk about more, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're going to talk about very specifically. So this is something that we're going to talk about very specifically and we're going to focus on in the next session that we have, inshallah. Um, Ghazwa Tabuk, and I talked about this before when we started off the conversation about Tabuk. In firu khifafan wa thiqalan. It was mandatory to go for Tabuk. If you were physically, if you were male, who was physically able, physically capable, and you could afford your provisions for the journey, it was mandatory. You had to go. You had to go. Only those people could stay behind, women and children, the elderly, somebody who physically could not go, somebody who did not have a ride and provisions, and, or the Prophet ﷺ told you to stay. Like Ali bin Abi Talib. Who even then Ali bin Abi Talib felt so bad, we talked about this, that he came out of Medina crying. Why do you leave me behind? Are you not, are you not happy with me, O Messenger of Allah? Why do you leave me behind? And he said, no, I leave you behind because I trust you and I need somebody to watch Medina for me. This is Medina. This is the masjid of the Prophet, the city of the Prophet, the family of the Prophet is here. I need you here. And so those were the only people allowed to stay behind. And many of the hypocrites, the munafiqun, who, you know, these were people who acted like Muslims, stayed in the Muslim community because it was advantageous. They saw that the Muslim community was growing, and so they wanted to be along for the ride, but they were constantly working behind the back of the Prophet ﷺ to try to take him down. And they had been caught on many occasions. And like we'll see here as well, so far up to this particular point, whenever they were caught, whenever they got busted, you know, and they, their, their, their reality became exposed, there were some questions that the companions had, that why do we not take more drastic measures against them? 
And every single time the Prophet ﷺ said no, because then people will say, Muhammad kills his own people. Muhammad persecutes his own people. Billah. Right? And so that's why I don't do that. We have to tolerate them. This is a necessary evil. This is a test for all of us. How we conduct ourselves, how we handle ourselves. Okay? And to think about the type of patience and the type of um, iman, the type of faith, the type of conviction, certainty that you need in order to see your enemy smiling in your face every single day, knowing that the first opportunity this guy gets, he'll stab me in the back. But to still have that much patience and have that much faith and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God has a plan. It's really remarkable. So, this group of munafiqun who should have come on Tabuk because of they qualified to come, but they obviously didn't come because they're hypocrites. What they did was when they heard, they were keeping, they had some scouts keeping an eye on the route back to Medina. And they said, notify us when the Prophet ﷺ is like halfway back to Medina, then notify us. So when the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims were about halfway back, and the news reached them that he's about halfway back, they said, okay. There was about, some, some narrations mentioned that there were 14 of them. Some of them say that there were about 12 of them. So 14 seems to be the more authentic narration. These 14 guys, what they did was, they left Medina, they arrived there where the army, the, the, the Muslim army and the Prophet ﷺ were staying, near a valley, a mountain pass. They, they got there at night, and in the middle of the night, you know, close to Fajr time, they quietly came, and they just kind of blended in and joined into the army. Like, oh, I've been here the whole time. There's 30,000 people. I didn't see you. Well, you know, you probably missed me. I've been here the whole time. These are liars, right? They're hypocrites. And so, they do that. And Urwa and many other companions, they narrate this incident. That in the morning time, when they started departing, they continued on with their journey and they started walking. The Prophet ﷺ was walking. And... Ammar bin Yasir radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, when the companions of the Prophet ﷺ was kind of walking ahead of the Prophet ﷺ because he was responsible for making sure the animal of the Prophet ﷺ was properly going in the right direction. Another companion by the name of Hudayfa, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was holding the rope of the camel of the Prophet ﷺ, just making sure the animal would not, you know, would not act out or anything like that. And so they were going, the Prophet ﷺ kind of called them near. So first of all, they, they were going and the Prophet ﷺ looked really upset. He looked really upset. And Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu knew the Prophet ﷺ so well by this point, when he looked up at the face of the Prophet ﷺ and he saw how upset he looked, he said that, عَرَفْتُ فِي وَجْهِ الْغَضَبِ I recognized that the Prophet ﷺ was upset about something. So I asked him, is everything okay, O Messenger of Allah? So the Prophet ﷺ called me and Ammar, and one narration says only Hudayfa. And Ibn Kathir says that the more authentic narration is that it was only Hudayfa. When Hudayfa looked at the face of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, is everything okay? He said, come here, come closer to me. And then the Prophet ﷺ started riding a little bit quicker. And he said, keep up with me, ride up forward with me. And he kind of moved away from the pack. And then the Prophet ﷺ asked him, هَلَا عَرَفْتَ هَؤُلَاءِ الْقَوْمِ Look back, do you notice some people? And he said that, I noticed, I, I looked back and I kept looking back as the Prophet ﷺ asked me a question, do you notice something fishy? And I looked and I immediately didn't see anything, so I started to get nervous, am I supposed to see something? So I kept looking, kept looking, kept looking, until I finally spotted some of them, because they were, they were so cliquish, that they were all kind of moving together inside of the crowd, and I saw them. And... The Prophet, and then I, I mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ that, are you talking about those people? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, I'm talking about those people. And he said that, Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala, and the Prophet ﷺ told him, he said that these people did not come with us. They snuck in last night, they blended into the group, and now they're coming back with us, acting as if they've been with us the whole time. And they're, they're, they're taking advantage. And they're, they're being dishonest and they're lying. These are the hypocrites. And Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says very, 
naively, I asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, أَفَلَا تَأْمُرْ بِقَتْلِهِمْ Why don't you tell somebody to take him out? And the Prophet ﷺ said, أَكْرَهُ أَنْ يَتَحَدَّثَ النَّاسُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا يَقْتُ الْأَصْحَبَهُ He says, I don't want people to be able to say that Muhammad persecutes his own people. He kills his own people. And so, no. And Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes on to say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the names of all 14. He mentioned to me the names of all 14. Who were these 14 people? So and 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 so. And after he was done, he then basically swore me to secrecy. He swore me to secrecy and he says, I'm talking to you, but don't tell anyone else. And because of this, it mentions Ibn Kathir rahmallahu ta'ala, he mentions that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he one time asked Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, aqsamtu alayka billahi ana minhum? Hal ana minhum? He said, I, I, I ask you in the name of God, am I amongst that list of people? And he said, la, la, no, I'll tell you that no, your name was not in that list. وَلَا أُبَرِّئُ بَعْدَكَ أَحَدًا But I will never even answer that question ever again. So don't ask me again. يعني حتى لا يكونوا لا أكونوا لا أكونا مفشياً سر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم So that I am not guilty of exposing the secret of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم So this is something else that transpired on the way back from Tabuk to the city of Medina, that where we saw somebody very, very admirable and someone really amazing, who um, the Prophet ﷺ made a lot of dua for and he prayed for. At the same time, we also see the opposite example of these hypocrites who tried to take advantage of the kindness of the Prophet ﷺ and tried to get credit for something they did not do. And Allah talks about them in Surah to Tawbah, يَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ مَا قَالُوا وَلَقَدْ قَالُوا كَلِمَةَ الْكُفْرِ وَكَفَرُوا بَعْدَ إِسْلَامِهِمْ وَهَمُّوا بِمَا لَمْ يَنَالُوا وَهَمُّوا بِمَا لَمْ يَنَالُوا They tried to take credit for something that they did not do. وَهَمُّوا بِمَا لَمْ يَنَالُوا And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes them in the Qur'an that these people are a bunch of liars. And not only that, but Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to say that Allahumma armihim bid Dubayla. That oh Allah put them in Dubayla. The Prophet made dua against them and the Prophet did not do this very lightly. He did not do this very frequently. Allahumma armihim bid Dubayla. Oh Allah put them in Dubayla. So he says, Hudayfa says, I asked Ya Rasulullah, wa mad Dubayla? What is Dubayla? And he said, "Shihabu min narin yaqa'u ala niyati qalbi ahadin fayahlik." That this is fr- it is a flame from the fire of hell that will come upon their hearts and will destroy them. That basically the Prophet ﷺ said that these people are doomed to hell. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ in a hadith in Sahih Muslim he says, "Fi ashabi ithna ashara munafiqan la yadkhulun al jannah hatta yilj al jamalu fi sami al khiyat." That there are 12 people in this group. This narration mentions 12 people. There are 12 people in this group that they will not enter paradise until or unless a camel can pass through the hole of a needle. Where you thread the needle. Unless and until a camel is able to pass through that. It's an expression in Arabic. Meaning these people will never enter paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from such a fate. Now the last thing that I'll talk about here today is once the Prophet ﷺ arrives back in Medina, he was faced with another crisis. As soon as he arrived back in Medina, like he had not even gotten back into Medina, he was still on the outskirts of Medina and he was faced with a crisis. What was this crisis? Surah Tawbah talks about it, the end of Surah Tawbah talks about it. And I'll share the ayat in just a moment after I tell you what exactly transpired. When the Prophet ﷺ arrived near the city of Medina, and he was on the outskirts of Medina in the area of Quba. Those who have been for Hajj or Umrah, they visit the city of Medina, they're familiar with the Masjid of Quba. The Masjid of Quba, according to the opinion of many scholars, is it can be called the fourth most sacred site in, in Islam. It is the fourth most sacred site in Islam. 
Why? What's meant by sacred? What sacred means is that visiting there is a ritual act of worship. There is a specific, precise reward for visiting that place. Like, the reward for coming to the masjid applies to every single masjid. That if you go and you pray in the masjid, the hadith of Bukhari says, your prayer, reward of your prayer is multiplied 25 times. That's for every single masjid. But when it comes to a specific masjid where prayer there has a special reward, we know of the, of the big three, the top three. Right? You have Al- Al-Haram, right? Al-Ka'ba, all right? Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca, all right? that the prayer there is multiplied, the reward is multiplied a hundred thousand times in one narration. Then you have Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi Al-Sharif, the Prophet's mosque in the city of Medina, where pra- reward of the prayer is multiplied 50,000 times as one narration says. And then you have Masjid Al-Aqsa, Masjid Al-Aqsa, okay? in Jerusalem. Where the Prophet ﷺ tells us that the reward of every single prayer is multiplied a thousand times. Okay? Um, and then the fourth place that you have is a masjid of Quba. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever makes wudu from their home, and then goes to masjid Quba, and offers a prayer in masjid Quba, they get the reward of having performed in Umrah. You get the reward of having performed in Umrah. There's a special reward for it. So that's the Masjid of Quba. And that's relevant to this incident. So when the Prophet ﷺ was near the area of Quba, he got some news. He got news that there was a new masjid that had been constructed, that had been built near the Masjid of Quba, in the same area. And that's peculiar, why? Because the Messenger of God, Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ, is alive. What that means is that a masjid does not get built without his approval. And he was gone for a couple of months. He comes back and there's randomly a new masjid. Right? So where did this come from? First of all, there's no permission. Secondly, there were some fishy circumstances. It was very close to the masjid of Quba. There was no need for a masjid there. That's number two. Okay? And then number three, the people that were involved with the constructing of the masjid were very suspect. They were troublesome people in the community. And nobody else could say conclusively that they were hypocrites, but the Prophet ﷺ can say, and he did confirm, that these are hypocrites. And fourthly and finally, there was already very suspicious circumstances. So Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu came to visit the Prophet ﷺ and informed him that this masjid has come up here. I have not said anything, no one has done anything. We were waiting for you to get back, but we wanted to let you know that there seems to be something wrong here. But we, of course, were waiting for you to tell us what to do. And they also sent a delegation to the Prophet ﷺ saying, Oh, we were waiting for you to get back, you know, but while you were on your way back, we thought we'd go ahead and get a head start on the project. So we put this masjid together. So you know, the Prophet ﷺ every single Saturday used to go and pray in Masjid Quba. He used to walk from Medina and go pray in Quba. So he said, we would also like for you to come and pray in our mosque, our new masjid. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses of the Qur'an. And those are the verses at the end of Surah Tutoba, verses number 107 through um, 110. 107 through 110. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا That these people who have constructed a mosque, they have done so to cause harm and detriment to the Muslim community. وَكُفْرًا that this, these people are actually disbelievers, they're hypocrites, they don't really believe. وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And they've done this to divide the community, that's why it's so conspicuously close to the Masjid of Quba. وَإِرْصَادًا لِمَنْ حَارَبَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ And not only that, but they built this masjid to serve as a headquarters for the people who previously have declared war on Allah and His Messenger wasallam. The enemies of Islam. There specifically was a man at the time of the Prophet ﷺ by the name of Abu Amir al-Rahib. Abu Amir al-Rahib. He was a Christian monk. But he had decided to take a stance against the Prophet ﷺ and fight against the Prophet ﷺ. He was actually one of the key people who after the Battle of Badr, he went to Medina, uh, he went back to Mecca and he campaigned and petitioned over there, literally campaigned over there, you need to raise an army and come back and attack Medina and I'll support you. And so he was one of the architects of Uhud, the Battle of Uhud. So he was a declared open enemy of the Prophet ﷺ. And he used to be called Abu Amir al-Rahib. The Prophet ﷺ called him Abu Amir al-Fasiq. 
He used to be called Abu Amir the monk, the Prophet ﷺ, the devout. He, the Prophet ﷺ named him Abu Amir the sinful, the treacherous. Alright, so he had not given up his mission against the Prophet ﷺ. So this mosque was a place where he used to come in the middle of the night and meet with the hypocrites to plot and plan against the Prophet ﷺ. So God exposed all of that in the Qur'an. Where he said, "Wa sada liman harab Allah wa Rasulahu min qabl, wa la yahlifuna in aradna illa al-husna." They will swear that they had the best of intentions to establish this space. Wallahu yashadu inna hum la kadibun, but God testifies that they're a bunch of liars. La taqum fihi abada. Allah forbade the Prophet ﷺ. Don't you ever dare go and pray in that mosque. لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَقُومَ فِيهِ A mosque, a place of worship that was established for the, based on the consciousness of Allah, with Allah in mind from the very first day, is a lot more deserving for you to go and pray there. Meaning the Masjid of Quba. You go and pray in the Masjid of Quba once a week, every week, and you need to continue to do so. فِيهِ رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَتَطَهَرُوا Because there are people in that community, in that masjid, who want to purify themselves. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُطَّهِرِينَ Allah loves people who purify themselves. أَفَمَنْ أُسِّسَ بُنْيَانَهُ أَفَمَنْ أَسَّسَ بُنْيَانَهُ عَلَى تَقْوَى مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانٍ خَيْرٌ أَمَّنْ أَسَّسَ بُنْيَانَهُ عَلَى شَفَى جُرُفٍ هَارٍ فَانْهَارَ بِهِ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمِ And Allah asks a simple question. What's a better foundation? A foundation based on the pleasure of Allah and God consciousness? Or a foundation that is built on the anger and the wrath and the punishment of God in the fire of hell? Which one is better? He asked that very obvious question, وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْتِ الْقُمَّ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah does not guide oppressive people. لَا يَزَالُ بُنْيَانُهُمُ الَّذِي بَنَوْ رِيبَةً فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ إِلَّا أَن تَقَطَّعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ اللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ That these people that have built this foundation on the foundation of doubt, this will continue to create more and more and more doubt within their hearts until it eventually destroys them. And God is all-knowing and all-wise. And so when these verses came down upon the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ sent a few sahaba there to go there and to tear that masjid down and burn it to the ground. And we shouldn't even say masjid, that place. To burn it down and tear it down and destroy it. Because it was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's exactly what was done. And this, there's a very profound lesson here. That there's two things I'll mention here. Very briefly, but very important. Number one, this is why, this is a very scary reminder in the Qur'an. That we always have to think about what are the foundations of our communities. What are the, you know, and something else that some of the books of hadith and seerah mention, that structure that they had built was even nicer, like in terms of construction, was even nicer than the structure of Masjid Nabawi. But that made no difference. We spend some, some, so much, sometimes we spend so much time obsessing over the structure, the look, the construction, the, the, the vanity of a place without ever thinking about what are the values that it espouses? What are the values that it is built upon? What are the values that it calls to? How are people treated when they come in there? What do people leave there with? That's what we have to think about. The Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, this is something I talk about quite often, I don't want to speak too long, but the walls of the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ were mud, dried mud. And there were some rocks. They stacked up a bunch of rocks, they plastered it with a bunch of mud, and they just let it bake in the sun. And that's what it was like. The roof, date palm trees had been chopped down, and the logs, the trunks, had been laid across, and the space in between was filled with leaves of date palm trees. And when it would rain, the water would still drip through. The ground of the masjid was the dirt, the ground, the earth. And eventually a sahabi came and he put some pebbles down. But even then the pebbles used to poke them. Like it still wasn't a perfect solution. It used to be dark, so dark that at Fajr time, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, you couldn't recognize a person praying next to you. La yu'arafna min al-ghalas. You couldn't recognize who was praying next to you. 
And then finally in the ninth year of Hijrah, Tamim Dari brought and put a lantern in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Nine years later there was light. That's how simple the structure was. But it was one of the most blessed places on earth. Guidance spread from there to all of humanity, to, to all, all, all across the world. And humanity still flocks there till today. And this masjid might have been nicer, but the foundation, the values, the ideas that it was built with were corrupt. And it had no value, no significance in the eyes of God. It's a serious gut check for each and every single one of us. Building of a community, establishment of a mosque is a very beautiful, very noble endeavor and project. But we also have to do a lot of soul searching. Constantly. Keep revisiting. Why are we doing this? Why is this here? What are we trying to achieve? What are we achieving and accomplishing? We have to constantly be thinking about that. And the second thing I'll mention is, Allah declared that this masjid was evil. This place was evil. And that's why the Sahaba did not, Ali radiallahu ta'ala who was in charge of Medina, did not do anything, did not say anything, until the Prophet came back. At the same time, what you will come across sometimes in certain communities is, people will use this example to try to, um, to try to sabotage somebody else, to try to put someone else on blast, so to speak, right? And try to, you know, revile someone else, antagonize another community. We have no right to do so. We are not allowed to do that. I cannot sit and say, we're masjidun usisa ala taqwa, we're the good mosque, they're the bad mosque. I don't get revelation. Neither do you, nor does anyone. So we do not have the ability to definitively say, that is masjid dirar. That's very bad. And we're not supposed to do that, we're not allowed to do that. These verses are present in the Qur'an for us to check ourselves. Not to gauge and measure someone else. Are they dirar or not? No, 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 it's for me. Okay? And with that, the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, they arrived back in the city of Medina, and the last thing I'll mention here is in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Inna bil madinati aqwaman, ma sirtum masiran wala qata'tum wadiyan illa kanu ma'akum. That there were some people who were back home in Medina, every valley you passed through, every mountain you climbed, everything you went through, it's as if they were with you the whole way. They were with you in spirit, and they will get the reward. Ya Rasulullah, wa hum bil Medina? They said, but they were in Medina. How, how were they with us? Like how did they get the reward? The Prophet ﷺ said, wa hum bil Madinati, habasahum al udru These were people who sincerely wanted to come, but they had legitimate reasons why they were not able to come. So God gave them the full reward. And finally, Imam Bukhari also mentions that when they arrived close back to the city of Medina, and they could see the city of Medina in the distance, the Prophet ﷺ pointed to the city of Medina and he said, هَذِهِ طَابَ هَذِهِ طَابَ There's our beautiful home, there's our beautiful home. And the Prophet ﷺ said, وَهَذَا أُحُدْ And here's the mountain of Uhud. جَبَلٌ يُحِبُّنَا وَنُحِبُّهُ This is a mountain, it loves us and we love it. This is home. The Prophet ﷺ had such a profound love for the city of Medina. And we've all heard the very famous story that the Prophet ﷺ, when he arrived in the city of Medina during the Hijrah, when he arrived, then everybody came out of their homes singing and welcoming the Prophet ﷺ. طلع البدر علينا من ثنية الوداعي وجب الشكر علينا ما دعا لله داعي. Some of the scholars mentioned that the same poem was said also. Some mentioned that it was only said at this occasion, not at that occasion, not at Hijrah, but when the Prophet ﷺ came back from Tabuk, because when they left, they were gonna go fight the Roman army that was ten times their size. So they didn't know if they were gonna come back or not, but when the Prophet ﷺ came back, they were so happy, they sang this, um, welcoming the Prophet ﷺ back. And Ibn Kathir ta'ala says it actually happened on both occasions. That when the Prophet ﷺ came back home, they sang this welcoming the Prophet ﷺ back home. And lastly and finally, there's a very interesting kind of fact about Tabuk. There are only two people behind, behind whom the Prophet ﷺ prayed Salah. There are only two human beings who led the Prophet ﷺ in prayer. The first is Abu Bakr, during the last few days of his life, of course, because the Prophet ﷺ told him to. And the second is Abdurrahman bin Auf. 
And this was on the journey of Tabuk. Because during the journey of Tabuk, the Prophet ﷺ had to use the restroom. And they couldn't find a good place, a private place for him to go and use the restroom. Mughira bin Shu'aba, a companion of the Prophet, was with him, taking him. And they kept on going and going and going and going. And finally, they found a place really far away for the Prophet ﷺ to use the restroom. After he used the restroom, then they were looking for water for him to do wudu. And then they finally found the water. By the time they came back, the prayer time was about to end. The Sahaba had started to get nervous. What do we do? So they said, we should start praying. So they started praying, and Abdurrahman bin Auf led the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ came in halfway through the prayer, and joined into the prayer and prayed behind Abdurrahman bin Auf. When the prayer finished, and they looked back, and you know whenever you look back, you kind of like, somebody stands up and is finishing up the prayer, and you're like, oh, you know, Umar is here, right? So you kind of see someone, they turn around, they're like, oh, and they, it's the Prophet ﷺ standing up and completing his prayer, and they were all like, oh no. <laughs> like what did we just do? And literally the narration mentions that فَلَمَّا سَلَمَ النَّاسُ أَعْدَمُوا مَا وَقَعَ They started freaking out. <gasps> what do we do now? Right? When the Prophet ﷺ finished praying, what he had missed from the prayer, he said, أَحْسَنْتُمْ وَأَصَبَتُمْ What you did is good and what you did is correct. And there's, aside from teaching us, that that's what you do in that situation. It also teaches us another very profound lesson about the humility of the Prophet ﷺ. You didn't wait for me? If anybody could have ever said that, it was the Prophet ﷺ. You didn't wait for me? But he didn't say that. Because it's prayer time. Prayer is more important. You pray. And the Prophet ﷺ also showed us how strategically the Prophet ﷺ implemented a succession plan. He taught them how to pray. And he taught them how to lead the prayer. And he taught them how to have a congregation. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Maybe this was the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ to see if they would know what to do in this situation. So you see the succession planning of the Prophet ﷺ as well in this scenario. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashad wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Mm-hmm.